sharing now. All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our monthly Canadian Virtual Astronomy Seminar, or Canvas Talk, where we feature the work of Canadian postdocs. This week, we'll be hearing from Dr. Josh Spiegel, a Dunlap and Banting postdoctoral fellow currently located at the University of Toronto. Dr. Spiegel will be talking to us about Milky Way structure with his talk, Mapping, Milky Way, the, Mapping the, Milky, the Milky Way Near and Far. But first, we would like to start with a, a land acknowledgement for those of us located in Toronto. We acknowledge the land we are meeting on is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Ashinabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat people, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Metis people. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 of the Mississaugas of the Credit. So without further ado, I would like to introduce everybody to Dr. Uh, to Dr. Spiegel. Josh obtained his, P his BA in astrophysics and physics at Harvard University at 2015, in 2015 after spending a year abroad at the, at the Kavli Institute for Physics and uh, Mathematics of the Universe. At the University of Tokyo, he returned to Harvard where he obtained his MA and PhD in astronomy in 2020. He left Harvard for the University of Toronto where he is now a Banting and Dunlap postdoctoral fellow. Mm -hmm. His research focuses on trying to combine approaches from astronomy, statistics, and data science to understand how galaxies like the Milky Way form, behave, evolve, often using large, publicly available data sets that include millions of stars and galaxies. So with that, Dr. Spiegel, please take it away. All right. Well, thank you for the really lovely introduction. Uh, and it's great to see everyone uh, online today. Um, so, yeah, as, as Leo mentioned, I'm Josh, uh, so I'm uh, in this interesting place where I'm, if you sort of zoom down to the bottom, I uh, somehow am both in statistical sciences and uh, astro astronomy and astrophysics, and that sort of is an exact description of what I hope to talk about today, um, and what I'm always really excited about, which is uh, trying to find ways to combine uh, statistical methods, apply them to interesting problems in astronomy, and hopefully get out some, some new stuff. Um, you know, often accompanied with some cool data visualizations and, uh, and some fun, in this case, often unexpected results. So that's what I'll try and highlight today. Uh, and to start out, I just want to ask uh, sort of this question about what really is the Milky Way, which I think is going to guide a lot of, of sort of the motivation for this talk. And to um, a lot of astronomers, I think this is an obvious question. It's the galaxy we live in. Um, but observationally speaking, right, if you talk to an amateur astronomer or just, uh, you know, people who are looking up in the night sky, traditionally it's been, well, this, right? The Milky Way is this sort of band of stuff that cuts across the night sky that has fascinated, uh, you know, people for generations. Um, there are lots of amazing uh, astronom astronomical stories about um, the Milky Way uh, and, you know, all over the world. And this is exactly what, you know, has been fascinating people for centuries. Um, but really like the question is what, what exactly is going on here when we're looking up at the sky? Um, this is a picture I really like as well. Uh, ah, okay, great. So questions at the end. Otherwise, you know, feel free to interrupt during the talk and I will try and answer them as they come. Um, this is the Milky Way seen from space with the Gaia space satellite, which has been super cool. Uh, so this is this, you know, full sky view of the galaxy as seen, you know, from our perspective here on Earth. And you can see just tons and tons of stars everywhere. Uh, you have other galaxies, you know, here's Andromeda. Uh, and then you have all these other features, these various dust clouds, stellar densities. And you can see just there's a lot of stuff that's going on. Um, and so if you want to understand sort of this general thing, uh, like our own galaxy, one of the best tools is to go and look at other galaxies. Um, one of the questions I have in my research is trying to figure out what makes, you know, the Milky Way us. Or another way to say it is if you want to understand, you know, some individual person's life, say, you know, your own family or your friends, uh, one way to do that is to look at people they know and see if you can learn things about them uh, sort of by proxy. Um, you know, it's about understanding the context to which they've grown up or, you know, develop their opinions or views. And this is the same for our galaxy. And so one way to do this is we can go and look at a bunch of other galaxies. Here are a bunch of fun examples I just pulled uh, from various, you know, like ESA, ESO, Hubble, NASA archives, uh, primarily of spiral galaxies, which is what we think the Milky Way is. And you can just see by looking at these that there's this incredible amount of structure as present here, all these different features like spiral arms and uh, 
you know, star forming regions and dust lanes and things, those are all, you know, stuff that hopefully we can connect back to our own galaxy. And so in theory, this is really easy. We go off broad and we look at other galaxies and we say, cool, we can take tons and tons of images. You know, we have all these, this wide field imaging available now. We have Hubble, we're gonna have JWST data coming in soon, hooray. Um, and we just compare it to the Milky Way, right? And then, and then we're done. Uh, the problem of course, is that uh, we, we don't have a picture of the Milky Way like the one that's shown on the right. Um, this is an artist's conception. And, you know, the reason for that is pretty simple, which is that we're inside our own galaxy. And so because we're kind of embedded inside the Milky Way's disk, kind of always looking out in a certain place, uh, it's really difficult actually to figure out what our galaxy looks like and what its properties are. So it's kind of a weird place for it, where we actually can really see and study other galaxies in their entirety super easily. But our own galaxy is, is really challenging. So, you know, it's like we're trying to map out, say, like the human body from the inside. It's, it's a very different view of what's going on. It's a unique view and one that we can use to study tons of, of processes on really, really small scales and see how they connect to these big scales. But when we want to do these large scale comparisons and ask questions about galactic structure or spiral dynamics or just the number of spiral arms your galaxy might have, uh, that actually turns out to be quite challenging. And so that's a lot of what I want to focus on here is the importance of mapping out our own galaxy to make this comparison to others, uh, to better understand sort of where we come from and really what we look like. And so what we, in theory, what we see is, you know, we have this model. And so we're here and we look at a particular, you know, region as we look out at the sky. And so what we see in terms of projection is this on the right, you know, we have this data, that's just the stars and lights kind of be observed. And so the central question that, that I want to talk about today is how do we go in reverse? How do we actually take this data that we observe, you know, all these stars in the night sky, their projected motion, kinematics, and all these things that we can actually go and measure, and then use that to reconstruct sort of this, uh, you know, unified 3D model and try and uncover galactic structure. And this turns out to be a very non-trivial problem. So in this like uh, seminar, I wanted to give kind of a four part overview for this. Um, and I'll have quite a bit on sort of the history and background, which I think is very fun and helps to contextualize just how difficult a lot of this is. Uh, I'll have a little bit on some of the statistics involved with you know, how we then go from the data to infer the properties of many stars and use that to map out the galaxy. Um, I'm happy to talk about lots of details uh, you know, in questions or, or uh, in Q&A because that's the part that I love the most is always the statistics um, and the application. Then I'll talk about two fun uh, things that, that me and my collaborators have done recently on trying to use lots of these statistical tools and large data sets to map out uh, both the Milky Way nearby, the local solar neighborhood in particular, you know, within like a, uh, one or two kiloparsecs, and then sort of scaling up to really look at, at visualizing the galaxy at large, um, you know, in conjunction with a lot of other work that's being done by many, many uh, other wonderful astronomers in the field. So, Let's go into the history or background here um, and ask, you know, what exactly is going on when we're trying to map out our own galaxy doing this sort of galactic cartography. And it turns out that this has been going on for quite a while. Uh, in fact, none other than the illustrious William Herschel uh, actually uh, found a map, you know, made a map of our own galaxy way back around 1781, uh, which was published in uh, this, you know, his tome on the construction of the heavens in about 1785. And that's shown here on the right. So this is a map of our galaxy, uh, you know, made almost, uh, I'd say at this point, like 240 or so years ago. Uh, and we can see some interesting features here. The first, of course, is that the sun's at the center. Uh, that makes sense. You know, we're making all these measurements away from this, the sun. But you'll notice there are two things that actually do stick out, which mirror a lot of what we observe today when we think about the galaxy. The first is that it's asymmetric right? In the sense that one side is much, there are many more stars in some directions than others. Um, so broadly speaking, it's kind of oblate. So there are more stars kind of looking outwards than looking up or down. And this, this makes sense. We now understand the Milky Way kind of uh, has this component where it's more like a disk. And so there are more stars as we look sort of within the disk outwards than if we look up or down out of the disk. And that's when it's replicated here. The other thing that you'll notice is that this is asymmetric also from left to right. So in other words, depending on the direction that you look. And if you look outwards, this direction kind of is away from the galactic center, you kind of get some stars that extend outwards and these sort of weird, uh, you know, the different extents. And when you look inwards, you get this weird 
you know, bimodal pattern, where if you look just at the center, suddenly you get this termination where there aren't very many stars after a certain point. In other cases, you get stars that extend way past or, or beyond that. And what's going on there? You know, what is Herschel actually finding? Well, it turns out that's due to the, that's where the galactic center is, where we know that there's a lot of stars, um, but we also know there's a lot of dust. And these are the two things that I want to focus on that makes mapping the Milky Way both really challenging, but also very rewarding. So how exactly did Herschel do it? And what can we learn from sort of this exercise uh, when trying to do this today? So to start off, let's just go back to this, this picture that we have here. So we have this nice image of the galaxy and then we want to you know, map out exactly how we go from this 2D image to 3D. So let's just zoom in for a particular section here. So what you see here is a bunch of stars, right? They have varying brightnesses and you also see they have varying densities. There are parts that have, are brighter or fainter where there are more stars or fewer stars. And Herschel makes two primary assumptions. The first is that all stars have the same intrinsic brightness. Okay, maybe it's not a terrible uh, you know, approximation to make at the time. Uh, and that means you can essentially just, you know, use the inverse square law to say, okay, all stars have the same, you know, intrinsic luminosity. Therefore, I can just go one over T squared. I understand how magnitudes and brightness work. Therefore, I can get a distance kind of by roughly calibrating stars to some benchmark. Uh, and you'll notice in the map that he had, right, there are no, you know, distance measures on this because this is all relative. So that makes sense. Okay, great. So we have inverse square law for one, assume that all the stars have the same brightness that allows you to get a rough distance metric. And two is assuming that the, there's no real material between us and the other stars. In other words, when the density that you see on the night sky in 2D traces the intrinsic density of stars in 3D. So places where there are more stars uh, have more that you can see have more stars and places where there are fewer have fewer. Um, and I wanna target both of these and highlight how they, they impact sort of what we can infer um, you know, based on understanding today. So first off, it turns out that stars um, don't have the same intrinsic brightness, right? Uh, Gaia has made these beautiful images of color magnitude diagrams or often called Hertzsprung-Russell diagrams. Um, and so what's shown here on the right is a version of this for Gaia. So this is on the y-axis is the absolute magnitude. So the intrinsic luminosity uh, in the Gaia G-band. Um, on the x-axis is the BP minus RP color. Uh, the color here is the density. Uh, and then there are some points in places where there's very low densities. How much you can see if you zoom in is there are three little sections. There's a main sequence. There's this giant branch up here. You have these white dwarfs down here as well that are much fainter. Um, and if we trace our way sort of through this, what you can see is that stars are you know, very correlated in terms of what their colors look like compared to their intrinsic luminosity. Um, and this correlation makes sense. It comes from a lot of stellar evolution that we now understand. Um, and the vast majority of stars that we observe are on this main sequence over a wide range of masses. Uh, and the spread for this is, you know, partly due to measurement error and things like that, but also a lot due to varying, you know, intrinsic stellar types uh, and chemical compositions like metallicity, um, rotation, and tons and tons of other effects that, that, that contribute as well. Um, and then you see these giants, which are much more luminous at kind of fixed temperature. Um, and then, of course, these white dwarfs, which really only you can see close by. So, okay, fine. Um, so if you put all these at the same distance, say if you have very good parallax measurements to construct, you know, an absolute color magnitude diagram, uh, then if you have some, you know, random star with some apparent magnitude, uh, then you want to get a distance to it. What you do is you just say, great, I have an observed color uh, at that color. You know, here's kind of what the conditional S, you know, distribution of the density of stars looks like. This is all empirical, right? We don't need to know anything about how stars work. We just need to have some set of stars that we know at the correct distance. And then you can say, great, I can, you know, derive a distance by simply looking at stars with the same color where I know the distance and then seeing what the distribution looks like. And so, boom, we have, you know, it's not a one-to-one -one mapping, but it is a quite direct mapping to the distance estimate just by doing this, this very easy direct comparison. The more bands you have, of course, the, you know, the more color combinations, the better you constrain the spectral energy distribution of the star, the more and more you can constrain these types of distances as you're looking at many different color magnitude diagrams. So, great. The second problem, of course, is that there's no material between us and other stars. It's not quite true. Um, as we know today, there is the interstellar medium, and in particular, there's dust. And so, you know, the other cell mediums comprise a lot of components, you know, gas, the multiphase, you know, uh, gas, various temperatures, dust, some of other material, you know, people look at polarization. 
And dust in particular is, is very important because while it's only about a percent of the ISM by mass, it ends up scattering about 30% of all the light. Um, and so, you know, the plot below is just showing a, a typical, you know, view of this that I like from Planck. Um, these are in galactic coordinates. So the Milky Way plane, uh, you know, kind of cuts through zero. Uh, and then the galactic center is at zero, zero here. So as you move to the edges, you're kind of looking away from the galactic center. Um, and as you look towards zero, you're looking towards it. This is all kind of swiveling in the, you know, in sort of the, um, uh, uh, in sort of the reference frame of looking at the galactic center uh, from the position of the, of the Earth. And what you can see is there's a lot of structure, right? Uh, there's tons of these, you know, interesting features in the dust. And in particular, you know, you can see that there's lots of very, very complicated structure, you know, close to the galactic center, some of it's nearby, some of it's far away. And there's a lot of dust as you look, especially in the plane, you know, right in the, the plane of the galaxy towards the galactic center. And that's just because there's a lot of stuff happening there. The, the density of stars is very high. There's a lot of materials, a lot of star formation. Um, and so there's just a lot of dust. And that's why Herschel uh, did not see a lot of stars in that area, simply because when you look in that direction towards the galactic center, especially in the plane, a lot of that starlight gets blocked. Now, that's not all bad. Um, you know, dust has a very particular effect on sources. Uh, it both, you know, extinguishes the light by either blocking or scattering it. Um, and so that's shown here on the left where you have this dust cloud uh, and you have stars, you know, you can see on the outside and then behind all the dust, you have no stars. And in the other case, it's actually reddening it. Um, so what this means is that the effect of dust is wavelength dependent. And so you're more effective at scattering light, uh, bluer wavelengths than uh, generally shorter wavelengths and longer wavelengths. And so as you have more and more dust, you're sort of scattering away more blue light. And so you're extinguishing that particular wavelength versus the other one. And that makes the star appear intrinsically redder and fainter at the same time. So you can see that, especially sort of as you get to the, the edges here, um, and this is in the infrared, which allows you to see stars through lots of this dust. In particular, this makes things pretty difficult. It maybe things would be okay if the dust was the same everywhere. And so we could figure out how to account for this, but it's not. Um, this is often parameterized by uh, what's called an extinction curve. Uh, so in this plot, you have more extinction kind of going up here, measured in these weird color excess units. Um, and then on the x-axis, you have this sort of one over wavelength measure. So blue is to the right, uh, and then red is to the left. What you can see if you kind of focus in on this is that these are an example of the broad range of extinction curves that have been measured in the Milky Way. In other words, the wavelength dependence of scattering um, and extinction on, on stellar light. And you can see there are two things that matter a lot here. The first is the shape of this curve varies a lot. And to first order, this is often parameterized by uh, a single number called RV, um, which is different from rate of velocity. Uh, it's sort of the ratio, at least in the V band, uh, for, for how steep the slope of this curve is. Um, and the second is what's often called the gray component, which is the normalization. So in general, how much light is kind of being blocked at very long wavelengths. Uh, sometimes it's very hard to calibrate and often is assumed. Uh, so both of these things matter because they connect to underlying physics. In particular, on the right here are two different normalization schemes, but the same data that show 328 different extinction curves. And what you can see just by looking at this from this wonderful work from uh, Fitzpatrick and Massa back, you know, almost 15 years ago now, um, is that there's a humongous range if you look at different targets of these, these dust extinction curves. And these are due to physical effects like changes in dust grain size distributions or composition like silicates versus carbonaceous grains. And this means that actually, you know, our understanding of exactly how light gets extinguished uh, for a particular star we observe is a little uncertain. So what does this all mean in the end, right? What's the, the upshot to all of this? What's the punchline? So before I had this very simple model where if you observe, say, a red star, uh, at a particular apparent magnitude, you want to derive its distance. You can get it just by comparing it to other stars with the same apparent magnitudes that, uh, you know, colors that you see. The problem with dust, right, is now you don't know what the intrinsic color is. It could be extinguished and reddened in a very particular way. And there's a lot of uncertainty in exactly what direction kind of in magnitude and color that that uh, effect has. And so that means that you go from this really thin purple to this really broad uh, sort of you know, location where stars could be. And if we just look at two extremes, we get this stellar confusion problem, which is you have this low mass solution that's possible. 
In other words, your star might be faint and red because it is actually faint and red. There's not a lot of dust in front of it. It's very close by. And so, you know, you have some M dwarf or something and, and that's why it looks that way. Or you can have this very, very uh, bright source that's very intrinsically blue, um, this high mass solution, right? You could be looking at something like, you know, uh, uh, say an F or a G, maybe even more than that. Uh, it has a lot of dust to make it, you know, uh, much redder and much fainter. And also you can stick it much further away to also adjust the brightness. Um, and this of course is even degenerate with things like metallicity, which often and age, which often cause very, very similar effects in terms of how they affect stellar colors. And so you see this even gets worse because if you look at particular at this high mass solution, there's even a degeneracy between whether it's a main sequence star often called a dwarf versus a, you know, a very bright post main sequence star often called a giant. Um, and so now you have this, this bimodal distribution where you, it either can be quite close and have the same color or really far away and have the same color. Um, and the difference in brightness is often, you know, orders of magnitude, which correspond to, um, you know, a, a large difference, but you're looking at a star that's maybe only, uh, you know, hundreds of parsecs away versus one that's, you know, over 10 or 20 kiloparsecs away. So that makes things very complicated. And here's sort of what this gives you in terms of uh, the results to all of this. So this is a snapshot. Um, where on the x-axis here, we're looking at sort of the log foreground dust, uh, in this case, measured in units of AV. On the x-axis, you're looking at uh, this log distance. This is distance modulus. Um, and each of these subpanels shows the uh, probabilistic estimates based on stellar photometry that I'll get into a bit later uh, for individual estimates of distance and rending uh, marginalizing over all of these other parameters. What you can see is that for a bunch of different stars, I think this is towards Orion, uh, you get lots and lots of different uh, uncertainties. In particular, you often get some that are, you know, bimodal. Uh, you know, these red crosses are the most likely, but there are solutions that, you know, uh, occur at, you know, for different values of dust at different distances. Uh, you see some of them have these very, very, you know, weird shapes and et cetera, et cetera. So it's, it's not great. It's quite, it's quite hard. And so because of this, when you're trying to do inference where you're inferring how far away lots of these sources are, you have a lot of uncertainties, you have complex degeneracies, and you often have multiple solutions. Um, and so if you want to do widespread application of deriving galactic structure from stars, you need large sample sizes, you need really robust statistical inference techniques, and you also need a lot of computing power, or ways to really look at specific stellar samples where these types of things do not apply. So in other words, getting rid of all of this confusion uh, from looking at, you know, all types of stars. Um, and these are kind of the strategies that some people have taken in the past. Uh, an alternative to this, which has been used primarily to do a lot of, of uh, galactic structure has been masers. Um, and so masers, if you're looking at these star forming regions are very specific, uh, you know, astrophysical phenomena where you can get sort of amplified uh, microwave laser emission uh, from really, really, you know, heavily obscured star forming regions. So in this case, we have a star forming region here, NPC 281, uh, and you get uh, this maser located right here uh, in this region of full blackness where we don't see any stars because they're just, it's so obscured. And so this maser uh, is, the great thing about masers is that they're super bright in the radio, which means, you know, they occur in these really, really dense star forming regions. Uh, and that means that it goes through all the dust uh, and you can there, and because in the radio, you can do interferometry, and that means you can, do, you can measure very, very precise parallaxes and get pretty good distance estimates of these things. So that's great. The con, of course, that's very time consuming. Uh, you know, to date, there have been thousands of hours of observing time that have been needed to only observe, you know, on the order of 100 sources. Um, but this gets rid of all the problems I just described, right, in terms of, of how difficult it is to do galactic structure. And so, Here's kind of the result of what we get. So on the right here, what you can see actually is I've overlaid two things. The background to all of this um, is the actual artistic impression of the Milky Way. And faintly, what you can see are these little colored points, these sort of yellow, green, and you know, red, and white, and blue. These are actually the masers that have been measured in particular by uh, Mark Reed. Uh, from the, uh, the Center for Astrophysics and, and the group that he's been uh, involved with and that collaboration uh, to get distances to, I think, something like a, you know 119 or, or on that order of, of maser positions and use those to fit models 
including with, um, with gas cinematic data to then derive this artistic conception I showed before. And so I just have overlaid these two to highlight exactly how that data corresponds to um, the final product that you see uh, you know, in sort of these artistic impressions. So this is kind of what's been done in the past. And so the question is, how do we scale up to do this you know, uh, today? Um, in particular, the, the thing that I want to focus on is using an alternative to masers, these sort of very specialized sources that require very specific conditions, only observed in these particular star forming regions, um, and are very, very expensive to get stuff to. Um, and that's one of the reasons why uh, we, we want to sort of move away from using them. They're rare and they're very time consuming. Um, right, we only have one of them in the star forming region, and you know it requires very special conditions to uh, to arise. Stars, on the other hand, you know they're everywhere. Right, you look at this image; there are thousands of stars in this image. There are, you know, they're all over the place, including you know maybe not at the place where there's most heavily obscured that we can see, but you know everywhere else in this area. And so they're very complementary. Stars are super common, uh, and images, especially wide field imaging, is super super cheap. And now it's just the norm. We have tons of surveys, SDSS, Gaia, LSST, PanStars, TuMass. I mean, I could just go on and on and name tons of tons of surveys. If I missed a particular survey, say from CFHT, I'm really sorry um, in the Canadian context. But like, I love all of that data. Uh, everyone who runs it, you guys are the best. Um, and, and they're just great. In particular, we now have a lot more computing power to handle sort of more sophisticated inference techniques that we need to do all this stuff. So that's kind of the idea is that stars are everywhere. We have the data. We're going to collect even more data. So why, what can we do to actually use it? Um, and that's where I'm going to start to get to the applications and move away from lots of the motivation to talk about lots of the um, kind of skim over pretty briefly how exactly uh, me and my collaborators are approaching trying to infer lots of these stellar properties, primarily from photometry, from images, um, as well as astrometry from things like Gaia. Uh, and then moving on to talk about some of the really cool stuff that we found with it, which I think is the most exciting part of, of this seminar. So at least for most other people, I love the stats. So the requirement here is kind of twofold. So we have this really messy problem as shown on the right. You know, that's what the actual, you know, uncertainties for many of these derived quantities look like for stars. So we need an approach that can handle two things. The first is that I can handle this really, really disgusting probability, you know, probabilistic uncertainties for a lot of sources. So it needs to be able to characterize, you know, multimodal and complex parameter gener degeneracies, and also needs to be robust. You know, we don't want to miss solutions all the time, or else we can't really trust that our method is going to be giving us results that, you know, um, we rely on for mapping out galactic structure. The second is that we need to be really fast. You know, we're talking about millions, now hundreds of millions. Gaia, we're thinking about over a billion sources, uh, individual sources that we need to model. And if we want this to be like, you know, reasonable compute, uh, we need this to only, you know, take seconds per object so we can really think about scaling up. Um, and so that sort of sets this tone for how exactly we want to do inference here. Now, the basic you know, overview for this, um, and I'll have, uh, I've submitted a paper describing this in a lot of detail that hopefully will be on the archive uh, in a couple of weeks once we finish responding to revisions, um, is to use uh, a Bayesian approach to simultaneously estimate sort of two sets of parameters. Um, and this is me breaking up the problem in a particular way to improve how the inference works, which I'll get to in a couple of slides. The first is intrinsic parameters of a star, which I call theta such as the intrinsic brightness. You can think of this as like the stellar type. So this thing to do with the stellar mass, the metallicity, the age of the star, um, possibly other things like uh, say, you know, alpha element abundance or rotation, but things that determine, you know, the actual physical properties of the star itself. And then there is secondary set of properties, which I call extrinsic parameters, uh, phi. And these are things like distance or dust. This is stuff about like where the star is placed in the galaxy. Uh, and you know what stuff is between the star and us. So things that are kind of independent of the actual stellar type, but still affect lots of the observables. Um, so, and of course, when I talk about dust, I'm talking about both of these general properties, both the amount of dust between us and the source, but also the type of dust, broadly parameterized by this one parameter, RB, um, that determines the shape of this extinction curve. So here's the model um, that we came up with. It's pretty straightforward. We just have three components. Uh, the first is that we have some observed brightness, uh, so the magnitudes, and we're just trying to say we have some, you know, methods going to fit photometry, 
Uh, we have some measured parallax that comes from, you know, for example, Gaia, which we really rely on. And then we have some galactic model prior that deter, you know, is telling us essentially the distribution of stellar types, you know, ages, metallicities, and densities, you know, throughout the galaxy. So like a rough prior for what we think the galaxy looks like, and hopefully one that we can update, uh, you know, based on the results of our, of our bits. So that's kind of the basic approach. Um, so then the question is, how do we actually go about and do this inference? Uh, so we have all these different components for the model, and the end result looks like this. Um, and one thing that I can say is that typically for people who do more statistics, you want to use methods like MCMC, this Markov chain Monte Carlo approach. This is really common in, in, astro in astronomy. Um, but in this case, it, it does not work out well uh, because MCMC has this approach where you kind of start from one position, you move around a bit to a different one. And so that requires you to be able to kind of like jump over these gaps um, in general. Uh, Oh, good question. So William asks, I guess there's no mention of using stellar spectroscopy to train distances because the guy did have no spectra. Yet, the BPRP spectra are coming in uh, DR3 um, for a lot of sources, uh, and that will be very exciting. Um, and stellar spectroscopy is very useful for constraining distances. I don't talk about it here, um, but spectral photometric modeling is actually really key because the spectra can give you really good constraints on uh, surface gravity, log G, uh, which then gives you uh, excellent distance constraints that are very complementary to photometry, which is really good at estimating things like temperature. Um, so yes, that's an excellent question. I'm not talking about that today, but uh, spectra are also very, very useful for, for getting distances out. So good question. So based on, on this you know, result, these MCMC methods don't work. We need an alternative. Um, and one solution is something called nested sampling. Uh, and this is what I, I kind of have become uh, somewhat known for uh, since I developed a sampling code called Dynasty, um, which is publicly available on, on GitHub uh, that implements a lot of nested sampling routines. And nested sampling is fun in that, you know, this is the logo, which actually shows uh, the code Dynasty sampling kind of itself, uh, or at least a distribution in the shape of the letters. Um, what you can see by the way that it functions is that nested sampling sort of goes from the outside in. And that allows it to adapt to really, really funky distributions and shapes, uh, in particular being able to handle all of this structure that comes up from actually sampling the letters. Uh, so this is one option is using some like more fancy uh, sampling technique, uh, but it turns out that for our purposes, it is too slow. Um, so I'll get into the technical details you know, later in the questions, but it doesn't turn out to work, at least for this particular part of the problem. I will come back to it a bit later. So, uh, solution two, which is what I love doing, is, is just throw the kitchen sink at it. And by that, I mean, like, really just take all the statistical tools that you have at your disposal and try and see if you can make this problem, like, break it down as much as possible. Uh, it turns out that that really does help. Uh, and there are sort of three parts that I'll, I'll sort of quickly summarize before I move on. Uh, the first is that it turns out that this problem can be broken up into two parts, one of which is that for a given stellar type, it turns out that solving for the distance in the dust, these extrinsic parameters is actually pretty straightforward. So if you think you know what the star is, then you can use this Bayesian linear regression approach, essentially fitting a line to the data in a more abstract sense to solve for a bunch of stuff analytically. So you can do it super fast. So great, so that's half of the problem, right? Now you just have to figure out what to do with the types of stars, the more difficult part. Then it turns out that because at least the way that we model stellar types for photometry doesn't need to be super sophisticated. We can kind of get away with using only a few parameters. So essentially, you know, initial mass, metallicity, and age to first order. Maybe some additional stuff with like rotation or alpha abundances. Um, or if you're thinking from like the spectroscopy point of view, essentially, you know, effective temperature, surface gravity, metallicity kind of give you, you know, most of that. So that means we can use this brute force approach where we can kind of just uh, generate a humongous grid. Um, and because computers are very good at evaluating things in parallel, uh, we can just evaluate a bunch of models at the same time. And this, this is, it turns out to work really well. Finally, uh, you then say, well, hold on a sec. This only works for, you know, the photometry. What about the parallaxes and the priors and stuff? That, that doesn't seem to fit into this model. And you're right, it doesn't. But it turns out that you can just implement a correction, essentially using something called important sampling to reweight the solutions. And important sampling is kind of demonstrated here. You have some guess. In our case, the guess is Gaussian. 
uh, you know, that's kind of the solution to linear regression problems is you get like the normal distribution, that's the green. And the distribution we care about is kind of this purple one, shown in purple. Uh, and so we uh, can do a little bit of like some reweighting where we evaluate the answers, you know, just over a small set of points. Um, and then we use that to kind of correct the green to make it look a little bit more like the purple. Um, and then once we have all these three components, uh, it turns out we can then really easily generate an arbitrary number of samples from the distribution and then life is great. Um, so, woo. so essentially this is really the kitchen sink. We're using like, you know, linear regression, brute force grid searches, you know, Monte Carlo sampling and all this stuff at the same time to try and really get this problem broken down into constituent components. And one of the big things this allows us to do is actually for the first time, at least in, as far as I'm aware, to simultaneously fit for not only the amount of dust, the AV, but also the actual shape of the dust curve, RV, simultaneously uh, for every single star. Um, the signal to noise for that is pretty low, but it is actually something that uh, is pretty exciting and we're hoping to build on uh, in future work. So the end result is you get something that, that looks like, you know, the mess that we observe over here. So all of the results here that are shown, you know, in this, this blue, uh, that's derived through this algorithm. The implementation uh, is uh, this public open source package uh, on GitHub that we're calling Brutus, uh, which is sort of for like brute force stellar distances. Uh, and it includes, uh, you know, built in plotting utilities, which are kind of highlighted here on the right. If you want to do like some predictive checks across a bunch of bands, um, a form release is planned in the coming weeks. So the documentation is a little sparse right now. Um, but you can, you can go grab it, you can use it, it's available. The relevant stellar models that the code uses are all there. Um, it's all public. If you have questions, you can email me or complaints or open up issues. Uh, so I'm very big on making sure that all that stuff is available for people to use. Plus you can also use it to just generate a bunch of stellar models from isochrones, which turns out to be a feature that a lot of people uh, really like. So if you want an easy interface to generate a bunch of you know, photometric data for stars from theoretical models, uh, from MIS in particular, then, then it's good. Okay, so that's all the preamble uh, for you know, the stats side, the motivation. Now we can go on to the really fun science and this is all gonna be about fun pictures essentially here um, and some really, really cool results. So the question is, what can you do now that we have all this machinery? You know, we wanna do this cool stuff. We built up all the statistical stuff to make this happen and this code base. Now I wanna apply it to do some fun science. In particular, one of the things you want to do is look at spiral arms. At least one dream I have is really being able to directly image spiral arms with actual like stellar data and with dust. Um, and that's something that uh, I'm happy to talk about in the Q&A, but I think we're still a little ways off from being able to do that. Um, we know that spiral arms, when we look at, you know, other galaxies in particular, this is where other observations are very helpful for our own are locations where new stars are preferentially born. So they're locations of new star formation. And that means they're also where molecular clouds um, and star forming regions are located. And so we have these young stars being born that we can see. We know that they have not traveled very far from their birthplaces. Uh, and so therefore, if we look at, for example, tracers like really young stars, gas and dust, we should be able to use those to map out both the kinematics and uh, spatial structure of these spiral arms. Um, so that's the idea, right? So you want to go from, you know, the picture we see over here to the actual data, which I've now sort of swapped to be on top uh, on the right here. And one thing I want to emphasize is that this data, which is again from, from Mark Reed's work, uh, if you removed all the fits to the spiral arms, uh, and you just colored all the points the same, uh, it's actually kind of hard to tell if you could identify very particular spiral features or, you know, classify them super easily. You probably can see that there are some, uh, but there's quite a lot of variation in the data. So to do this, that means we have to construct some sort of estimate of dust. And this is where this, you know, real, you know, uh, thing that you, that sounded like it was the worst, the fact that stellar uh, observations are so uncertain because of dust now becomes a huge strength. That's because when we look at the interstellar media, we have these stars that go through, we have this extinction of reddening. And so we see spatially these correlations between stellar colors, uh, and the actual amount of intervening foreground dust. Um, yes, no, Trey is correct. Uh, the read points are indeed color coded based on their positions in longitude velocity space, on face on space, and their fit simple log spiral models. Uh, so that is an excellent point. Um, and so, whoops, that means you can infer the distance and the distribution of dust from its effects on, on tons of stars. 
Uh, so in other words, you can use stars to do lots of uh, 3D dust mapping. So this is a product that was uh, led jointly by me and Catherine Zucker, who uh, at the time I originally made this slide was a graduate student at Harvard with me. Um, now she's a postdoc at Space Telescope. Um, and so our goal here, just kind of shown in this very simple uh, image is to, uh, you know, try and ask like, what would be one way of deriving a distance to a particular cloud? Here, this is Perseus uh, for star forming region. And so, our, our idea was if you imagine a little pencil beam that's looking in a particular area of the sky and you ask what is going on along that line of sight, you have a model that kind of looks like this. Um, so the y-axis here is the cumulative dust, the x-axis is distance modulus. And what's happening if you look at the details here is that in front of the cloud, we assume that there's some small amount of foreground dust. Then we have this very localized structure, which we take to essentially be a delta function um, or maybe have some very, very small width. And then behind the cloud, we have a bunch of stars. And these are all probabilistic. Um, so we don't actually know exactly the distance or the reddening to any of these sources, but we have some model to incorporate all this uncertainty uh, into the final thing. Then we can assume there's some scatter uh, and, and maybe we get some stars wrong. So we need some way of pruning outliers as well. Um, so we developed this statistical machinery and we apply it to a bunch of data. And kind of here's what it looks like uh, in sort of what our model is actually trying to do. So on the right side here, this is distance modulus. Uh, and the y uh, axis is, again, sort of cumulative reddening. This blue curve here, the step function, is the model we fit to the data. Um, this band sort of shows the scatter that we're estimating, at least for some of the things we observe. And this histogram on the top sort of shows the distance estimates that we derive. And you'll notice that, at least for this particular cloud, which is chameleon, um, we get this bimodal solution. Uh, and so this sort of brings up the same problem as before, which is when we don't have a lot of stars, especially in the foreground regions of these clouds, because either they're close by or they're in regions of low density, uh, then you can sometimes get these solutions where maybe the star, the cloud could be at one distance or the other. And this means that you know codes like Dynasty again come to the rescue to derive lots of estimates here. So that sort of is, is where the statistical methods again sort of come into play to hopefully derive very robust uncertainties to, to lots of these regions. So what's the, the end result? Well, to first order, if we compare with masers, the gold standard that I was highlighting earlier, so these are the ones where we get really, really excellent distances and we are very confident that we have uh, you know, good estimates to those and understand the systematics. Those are on the y-axis. Um, the x-axis is the estimates to our dust distances. And these are derived using these cheapo, commonly available stars. Um, you get this beautiful one-to-one -one correlation what we derive. Uh, when we fit a best fit line, we find it's very consistent with being one-to-one -one, uh, with like, you know, some uh, plus minus like, uh, you know, a few percent uncertainty. So this is great. This implies that overall we're getting results that are very unbiased um, when our model is valid and they compare very well to the gold standard. Um, and so then we apply it to lots of regions where we do and also don't have measures to see what happens. And so now I'm just going to jump to some cool interactive figures to actually show what this structure looks like. So this is one taken from our paper. Um, and Catherine is largely responsible for the construction of these really beautiful figures. Um, and this is an interactive one. So you can click on any of these individual you know, clouds to get estimates of what they look like. So I'm just going to click on Cepheus. I've already preloaded it, but hopefully this will also work. Um, on the left, if you go over this, it's the image from Planck data. So it tells you both where you are and also the amount of dust cumulative dust that's estimated from Planck. If you actually scroll on the right, each of the colors in this history, uh, in sort of each of these cells uh, on the sky uh, shows the distance that's estimated to that particular region. Um, if you actually go over them, what you can see is all the actual data. You can see the fit that we get. Uh, and you can also see exactly how well we do. In particular for Cepheus, what I love is you can see that there are actually two different components to this uh, you know, region, this cloud or star forming region. There's this nearby component, which is around like three to 400 parsecs. Um, and so you can see that here. You can also see all the deficits in our model where clearly there is some spatial you know, extent to this cloud. And then on the bottom, you can see that there's a second component, which is, you know, again, much more heavily uh, extinguished than the first, uh, you know, at the back here and how well we are able to do sort of modeling that. Um, and sometimes you can see, for instance, here where our model really breaks down because there's not Re, the component is actually quite extended. It's not really localized. 
So one of the things that's really cool about this is you can explore the data for yourself. You can see how well our models are doing. We provide all this so you get a sense of what the systematics look like. So you want to be very upfront about how well or not well our method works. Now, using sort of these two things, we then wanted to construct some nearby maps of what the galaxy looks like and see, see what we get. And so here's a, a map of galactic structure that we uh, recover using all of this. Um, and so what's shown here is a top-down view, a slice of the Milky Way um, in XY coordinates. So the sun is, is at the center in this view. Um, and the background the sort of grayscale is a 3 dust map that was led by Greg Green, uh, who is uh, at MPIA. Uh, and Catherine, again, uh, and I are responsible for all the individual blue points, these different star forming regions. And you have these little blow up panels here on the right, um, kind of highlighting, you know, by name, all these different areas. And you can see, you know, where exactly there's lots of dust and where we might be missing some. Now, this map is really cool because it actually helped to illustrate a bunch of stuff that we had not really anticipated before um, in two ways. The, the first I want to highlight is that we ended up finding, you know, this weird structure, this contiguous thing that went kind of perpendicular to the sun uh, that seems to extend, you know, through a lot of uh, big star forming regions nearby and in a way that we don't expect our systematics to, to really be relevant. You know, for example, in this case, where they all sort of vary along the line of sight. Um, in this case, it's all very perpendicular to that. So we were like, huh, what's going on here? Some additional modeling for this turned out a structure that uh, whose analysis was led by Joao Alves called the Radcliffe Wave, uh, which ended up in Nature uh, two years ago now, which seems an eternity, uh, given that it's still 2020. Um, and that's not highlighted in red. Uh, this is a different view, sort of showing different breakdowns of the structure from various angles, and just highlighting sort of this bottom stream here, uh, this sort of uh, damp sinusoidal, you know, oscillatory wave is kind of what ends up giving it the name. And one thing that's very excited about this is that not only is the structure very coincident with the local arm and we think, you know, encompasses a large portion of nearby star formation, but overturns sort of a 150 year old paradigm regarding kind of Gould's belt uh, in, in terms of how nearby stars seem to be forming, uh, you know, around the sun. So that was really cool and not expected at all. This was a complete serendipitous discovery that we observed in the data, uh, which, was, which was awesome. The other thing that I love uh, with all of this um, is, you know, that this data, you know, once you have these really high quality catalogs, you can often find even more interesting stuff in it. So not only did, did sort of Joao discover this really, really amazing feature, um, but Catherine later uh, ended up finding this local bubble. Uh, so when you zoom into the 3D structure and combine sort of these really, really robust distance estimates to these star forming regions, which again are tracing lots of this local star formation structure in these spiral arms, and you connect it up to proper motions and radial velocities and other kinematic information for these stars, you can get really, really excellent reconstructions of the evolution for lots of these things. In particular, for the local bubble, um, what Catherine was able to show in this paper that was uh, published in Nature this year um, is, you know, get an estimate for sort of the age and spatial extent of the local bubble, which I'm sort of just highlighting here. So this interactive figure, which again, all are online, you can all head out and explore. There are links in the talk. Um, sort of shows, at least from our simple modeling and from the data, kind of the extent to which we expect the local bubble evolved uh, over time for various, uh, you know, different contributions. And you can see just, you know, over time, how lots of these different star forming regions have evolved into the present day. So this has been super cool. It's allowed us to construct, you know, estimates for how many supernova probably triggered the local expansion and, you know, how old it is. Um, and that's all been, been really, really exciting. And this has been enabled again by sort of these big data sets and also lots of uh, you know, these statistical techniques. Uh, also, I'm sorry, yes, it's just Windows. Okay, so the final thing I want to you know, close off the talk is kind of uh, trying to apply this, this technique to map the galaxy at large, which is rather than just looking at some individual star forming regions, actually looking at everything in the solar neighborhood. Um, and so the way to think about this is just we want to map out all of the stars nearby. Um, and so we did a, a sort of pilot project as a proof of concept, uh, which is currently under revision. Uh, sorry, this has been accepted, um, which uh, involved about 170 million objects from Gaia and a couple other ground-based surveys in about 700,000 CPU hours. And so we call this catalog Augustus, since it's the first thing to come after Brutus. Um, the density of stars we targeted is shown on the right. Uh, you can notice there are two holes. 
Those are primarily because we're using only data that are above a galactic, uh, I always forget latitude or longitude of 10. So we're cutting out the plane because there are too many stars there. Um, and above a certain magnitude cutoff, which is our band and pan stars, which has data from uh, Hawaii, uh, cannot see through the earth. And so the south is kind of cut out here. Um, we also include data from in the infrared from two mass and UKIDS uh, and also unwise uh, in the infrared and available. So that's all the stuff. Uh, I'll skip over, you know, plots showing that our method performs really well compared to other approaches that have tried to estimate distances to lots of stars from Gaia and just jump right into, uh, I think, the most exciting stuff, uh, which is trying to interpret what's actually going on. So I'm going to skip over some of these illustrative stuff and actually just jump straight to the visualization since I'm running a little short on time. And because I think this is the most exciting part that really speaks to itself. Um, so I just want to close with this. So this plot here is essentially a uh, illustration of the bulk motion of stars on the night sky. So the same way that you might see wind maps or ocean current maps here on the Earth, what we've done is we've taken these 170 million stars, we've put them into this online uh, you know, visualization uh, tool that we've built called All Sky, which is available on GitHub. Um, and it's interactive. So what's shown here, for example, is you can click around and see the actual location uh, in galactic coordinates. You can see the direction of motion, the speed in kilometers per second. Um, you know, you can drag and move this around. The background is the density, uh, is the velocity, but you can change the overlay. If you, for example, want to see the density of stars here, you can change what that uh, looks we're like. We're gonna give you a one minute warning here, Josh. Yep. And, uh, you know, you can see clusters that appear here very naturally in the data. You can see dust. But I think the most exciting thing is you can actually go and look at the data in 3D on the surface of a sphere. You can look at different distance slices that we've estimated here and see all the different fun properties and ways that, you know, stellar, bulk stellar motion behaves as you move further, you know, away from the sun. And I just want to highlight at the end that, you know, one of the lovely things that you can do here is you can see, for example, uh, you know, serendipitous discovery of stellar structure. For instance, this, you know, stream of stars in the south that turns out to be associated with the dwarf galaxy Sagittarius that just really beautifully pops out of our data. Uh, and you can see is a nice contrast to stellar motion in the disk at sort of various distances, which are shown here. So the link is in the slides if you want to play around with it. And uh, with that, I will sort of conclude. Um, so rather than talk about some of the, uh, you know, exciting stuff about for the future. I just want to say I talked a little bit about the history and background, uh, some stuff on the statistics for inferring stars, some fun results of mapping the local solar neighborhood, and closed a bit with uh, mapping the galaxy at large. So I'm happy to take any and all questions. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Everybody uh, give your clap reacts if you would like. And uh, we have time for a few questions. So please raise your hand if you have a question uh, for Dr. Spiegel. Let's see, Did we get to everything in the chat first. Yeah, I hope I answered everyone's questions in the chat as they appeared. Yeah, I think you did. All right, so we have four minutes for questions. Uh, let's see. Um, oh, we have one question. Uh, uh, William, please feel free to unmute yourself. Yeah, hi. I, uh, yeah, I like how you organized the talk. It was uh, well done, I thought. Um, yeah, I was wondering about that um, Radcliffe wave that you've um, mm -hmm. That you found there. I mean, maybe it's a little too early to know what, what what's causing that. But is that some kind of like plasma instability, Parker instability, or or uh, Rayleigh Taylor instability? Does anyone really know yet? Oh, that's an excellent question. So we don't. Um, the given the size of the wave, it sort of I think the total extent is like two over two kilometers. Uh, sorry, two kiloparsecs. Um, the initial thinking on us was that it. You know, it could either be some type of gravitational instability in the disk that sort of, uh, since there have been other filamentary structure discovered, uh, or it could be some uh, larger scale phenomenon caused by like an impact from an accreting dwarf galaxy like Sagittarius, or maybe it, it could be some thing we haven't really thought of. We, we had a student, um, uh, Alan Tu, uh, who's 
looked at this and particularly by comparing sort of young versus old stars, we have been able to you know, determine that the structure is very localized in terms of its kinematics. And so it doesn't appear to be like some weird attractor solution that uh, affects lots of stars at once. So whatever caused it has to be somewhat recent, but we don't really have a lot of good ideas. Okay, okay thanks. All right, we have time for another question or two, if anybody has any. And if not, uh, then we can end ver uh, then we can end uh, <laughs> one, two minutes early. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Spiegel. Uh, very fun to learn about the structure of the Milky Way. Uh, thank you for sharing with us. And um, uh, thank you for joining us for our monthly Canvas talk. Next month, uh, I will be speaking about a uh, BCG in uh, an ABLE cluster. So please do join us in a month. Yeah, and I Take think, care, you know, thank you everyone for coming and hopefully, you know, if, if nothing else, I hope everyone is super excited that, you know, all the Gaia data and folk data that's available can do all this stuff. And so uh, I think galactic structure is super cool and the data look fantastic. So agreed. Fun visualizations too. All right. Thanks, Josh. That was great. Thanks very much.